Namahi Tony for the intro, Namahi Koto to all of you for coming to my talk. Yes, it's about documentation and I'll try and stick to time because I know I'm right before dinner. Um, it's a tough gig. Who am I? I am Nick. I work in application security at GitLab, I'm fully remote. I'm based out of Wellington. Before that, I worked for Aura InfoSec, which is a security consultancy, and I worked with development teams and security teams working on like risk management or secure coding, things like that. Before that, I was a Rails developer. Uh, if you go onto the schedule, uh, the talk description, you can get a link to these slides if you want to skip ahead um, or, or find some of these resources. Um, so yeah, it, it, this isn't going to be rocket science. There's not going to be any elite hacks. Um, this is the sort of thing, hopefully, where most of us could say, yeah, I can start doing that. Um, we're going to look at what makes documentation powered security. Then we're going to look at how does this work in practice where I work at GitLab and then wrap up quickly with some steps that you can take at your organization. Because in all my time as a security consultant before this, I never really saw anyone doing documentation well. Most of the time, people's documentation looked like this. You know, sad, lonely documents sitting on a shelf somewhere, uh, gathering dust. Maybe there was one person in an organization who loved documentation. Um, hint, that was me. <laughs> um, you know, some lone trailblazer. But yeah, most, most documentation was what I would call shelfware. Um, and what I want to do with this talk is take us from shelfware to, oh yeah, whoa. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, first, what makes documentation powered security? Uh, really it's just what makes good documentation. So I want to suggest four problem areas that I've observed and then four key things I think we can do to, uh, address this. Um, so I'll just go over these briefly and then go into detail. First thing is we want to take documentation that's hard to find and put it in a single source of truth. We want to take documentation that's irrelevant to something that's written and iterated on by the people that use it. We want to take documentation that's untouchable and make it something that has clear and followed approval processes for getting updated. And then finally, um, if we get to it, we don't have to, um, processes which are never automated to something that can be turned into automation. So let's go through these four things. When documentation is hard to find, maybe it's because you've got multiple locations, right? Like maybe the documentation is on this network drive. Oh, but maybe it's in Dropbox. No, it's in the Confluence wiki. Uh, no, actually, uh, you have to go and talk to a certain person about that because they like it when you have to go and talk to them to find out the answer. Uh, well, maybe you do have a single source but within that, and I saw this a lot at government agencies, there's multiple versions of a single document, you know, process underscore draft, underscore draft 0 0.1, underscore draft 0 0.1 NM. It's like, which one am I supposed to look at? Um, so we want to move away from that to having a single source of truth, something where there's no conflicting processes so that when people go and look for something, they know this is legit. This is what I'm supposed to follow. Uh, um, and we also want to have it so that it's always accessible. Uh, if, you know, if it's in someone's head, you have to go to that person. If it's on a certain drive, uh, maybe they need to log into their computer first and access, you know, go through this weird rabbit hole to access it. Make it um, one place, make it accessible. To, to achieve this, though, it does require a culture shift, I guess, teaching the team to adopt this process, because if the team want to keep things in multiple locations, or keep it in their heads, uh, then we're going to end up with multiple sources of truth. The next thing is making sure that our documentation is not irrelevant. Uh, sometimes this can happen because, say, the security team has a great idea about how security should work, and they foist it on, say, the sales team or the marketing team. And because it's not written for them and by them, they're just going to say, oh, yes, thank you, security team, we'll definitely do this and just put it on the shelf, and it's going to gather dust. It's been written by the wrong team. Um, if the users write it, or have a part in writing it, then it's going to answer the questions that they have in a way that they can understand, or a way that people like them can understand. It's not going to be some edict handed down from on high. And if those people can also update it when they need to, it's going to stay up to date. 
you know, maybe it's got screenshots for a system that we don't use anymore. They need to be able to update it um, as and when it's needed. This requires a culture where people are allowed to contribute when they see things that need updating. Um, it doesn't mean we all have to be great writers though. If you can just start something off with a proposal and then other people who love writing, you know, people like me, um, or even automation, right, can enforce style guides or spell checks or check that the links work. Um, just make a change, st start with a proposal, um, make it a culture where anyone can suggest updates so that will keep it relevant. Um, and yeah, ideally have a data store that supports that kind of interaction. Um, Word docs generally, I mean, they're getting better. You can collaborate in real time now in Word documents, but yeah, uh, maybe something different. Uh, we want to move away from something that's untouchable where you have to get approval from, you know, the C-suite or the executive suite to update the password policy. Like, yeah, they probably don't care like what the password policy is. They just care that they have one. Uh, so we need to make it a bit more democratic where anyone can suggest an update and hopefully, ideally, quite a few people can either uh, click accept. It's not going to be owned by just a single person. At GitLab, where we do it, it's not truly democratic. Like, we're not electing maintainers, right? Um, but there is like a hundred or more of them that can approve changes. Um, and with this approval process, we can still tick that compliance box saying, yes, all changes get reviewed. And we've reviewed it at least once in the last year because you've got, you know, a change history of when it was last changed. Um, so to, to get this, we need a data store that can enforce um, those approvals um, if needed and ideally also fit in those style guides and you know, automated um, checks. And it does require the people who have the power to make those approvals to make thoughtful but fast decisions. If people are going to be a stick in the mud, you know, oh, yes, we welcome change, um, but then make you go through a laborious change control process, you're not actually achieving the, the intent of um, this clear and followed approval process leading to regular updates. And then finally, if we can, um, moving from processes which are never automated to processes which can be automated. And the good thing about having this documentation that's written by the people using it and that it's been iterated on is you know what needs to be automated now. Like you've got this bullet point list of here's the process we follow and you can give that to a developer and say, please, we spend like an hour a day doing this. Can you help us? And then the tester can use that as their test criteria when your automation is being built. So in that way, you can, you can reduce the verbosity of your documentation, make them redundant. Um, and but the key thing here is not to do it too soon. You know, if you jump straight to automation before you've refined your processes and before they're well understood, you're going to waste a bit of money. So that's good documentation. How does this power security? Main one for me, like especially when I started at GitLab, it, it removes the, oh, no, what should I do? Like, hands up how many people have felt this during a security incident in their company. Like, it must be most of us, right? Like, what do I do now? If I have a single source of truth, I know where to look for how to handle something. If I know that it's been regularly iterated on, I know that the team has kept it up to date and I can trust the process. And I know that it's gone through an approval process, so I'm not just, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. So that's really good. That's like the main thing. And as a new person to a team, like the, the on, onboarding time was like super uh, quick and effective because I knew I could just check this documentation. Um, we, we have the luxury of being a, a global team. So being able to hand over at five o'clock, like there was an incident in August, like a severity one, I triaged it on the Thursday, worked on it on the Friday, and then at five o'clock, I followed the process for handover, closed my laptop, and went on holiday. And I, I knew, because everyone was using the same process as me, that I could do that. I could trust the team to follow the process. Like, me, I wasn't that important. The process is the important thing. Uh, and like I was saying, yeah, it, it enables process improvement. And when a vendor comes along with some shiny tool saying, hey, uh, buy this. You can see, like, will this fit into our processes? Will it actually save us time? Like, cost-benefit analysis. So how does this work in practice at GitLab? You can go and check right now. It's public. It's on the internet. It's Googleable. The source code is there as well. Um, our handbook is very large, though. Uh, 
I, we, our handbook is so large that it even has a page to measure how many words and pages our handbook has. And, you know, I was saying like regularly iterated on by the people that use it. I found this and it was out of date. So, well, I'll make a merge request to update it. So if it was printed, it would be 12,000 pages. And if you laid those pages out, it would stretch uh, 3,000 kilometers, which is like from here in Hammer Springs to Fiji. So that's a lot of content. And I'm very glad that Google has indexed it for us. Um, so yeah, uh, we've got the single source of truth, this public handbook. Team members know if I have a question, I can go out, look, look at this. Sometimes people ask a question in Slack and the first response is, here's the handbook page. And we also have this culture of if it's not in the handbook, well, then we need to iterate on it. So then you, you get the answer, whatever it is, and you add it into the handbook. So the handbook is staying up to date. Uh, we have uh, maintainers who review and approve changes before they get merged uh, into the main branch. Once it's on the main branch, that's the single source of truth. We can trust it. And then we also, yeah, do have the luxury of, um, you know, a whole bunch of developers that can automate things for us uh, when that would be more efficient. Let's take a look at two examples. First is going to be um, my team, the application security team's hackathon triage process. And then we'll quickly look at the security incident response team, the CERT team's uh, triage process. Uh, so just remember these are public. You don't need to try and read the slide. Um, but basically, it's a bullet point list of what to do. You know, down the bottom. I love bullet points. Um, it also has owners. So we have a thing called code owners. It says who owns this section of the documentation. It doesn't have to be approved by those two people. It can be approved by any maintainer. But this is like, yeah, who's responsible for making sure it stays up to date. Uh, and yeah, very prominently, it has these links to either view the source or make a contribution um, by opening the, the source code to it. And again, this is publicly searchable. Um, it's all written in Markdown, stored in Git. It's like a static website. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do it that way, but that's how we do it, and it works for us. There's like um, two areas um, that we've automated. So when a vulnerability gets reported um, through HackerOne, we need to figure out you know how urgently should we deal with this. And there used to be a big list of bullet points on how to calculate a CVSS score, which is the standardized way of um, communicating the severity of vulnerabilities. So this got laborious and we were like, well, let's just make a little web app, um, which we have now and you can click on it. And it says like, here's the severity, here's how much bug bounty to pay. Um, and it gives you, you know, you can click on it and get the markdown link and it's, it's great. And that meant we could make our documentation redundant. We just deleted a whole section of docs and say, click here for this calculator. Similarly, when we want to move an issue from HackerOne where it was reported into GitLab issues so that the team can work on it, we used to have a big section of the documentation with a whole bunch of bullet points. You have to create the issue. You have to create a, a CVE. You have to create a, or start the discussion around how much bounty to pay. And we turn that into a Slack bot. Uh, so you just type H1 import, put the ID, and it does all that for you. Uh, in practice, here's what it looks like. Oh, I guess going back, uh, it is regularly iterated on. That's, um, you see my face a lot because I love docs. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is an RCE. Um, this is public now, so you can Google GitLab RCE and it'll be one of them, is this one. Uh, so this was in August, the one that I went on holiday after working on. The bot has imported it for us. Um, it assigns the right labels, so it was an S1. Uh, because it's an S1, it knows what our SLAs are, so the team says, you know, the due date is August 26th. Uh, and then... I forgot to follow part of the process because I'm human and I was dealing with an S1 and I was mildly panicked. But because the process is public, other team members know what it should be. And so another team member saw, oh, you haven't actually, you know, at mentioned the people who are responsible for this area of code. And so Corey did it for me. And that was like a great example of how making your documentation accessible to people outside your team can help you follow your processes better and increase security um, within the organization. That was really cool. And anyway, we fixed it, released a critical patch, and then we also have a policy of making our issues public. Um, so there was a bot that came along 30 days post-patch and said, 
hey, Nick, you should follow the process for making this public. And I said, thank you, bot, and I made it public. Um, so that's kind of an example of how we've followed the process and also used automation to make it easier. Um, so yeah, the AppSec team are following a process that we trust because we know each other are working on it, keeping it up to date. Uh, we know that we're doing it consistently and repeated. And it means if we do like a root cause analysis or a retrospective and find somewhere where we could have improved the process, we have one place to go and do that. It's great. Another really cool thing is that people participating in our bug bounty program know what to expect from us because it can feel a bit like chucking your vulnerability disclosure into a black box and hoping you get some money out the other side. Um, for researchers that work with us, they can see the whole process end to end. They can also go and look at past reports, which are now public, and see us living out this process. Um, GitLab teams also understand where those due dates are coming from. Effectively, we're just hoisting these things on it and saying, hey, this is really important and you need to fix it now, even though you want to work on features, which doesn't, it's not always popular, right? Uh, but because the process is there and they can understand it and read it, um, they can, you know, self-answer these questions about why it's important. Uh, do we have time? Uh, no, we'll skip this. Okay, cert, have a page. It's a controlled document. It's written for cert and for compliance people. Uh, but most people use the thing as like, what do I do if I get a text from Sid, our CEO? Or what do I do if I get an email saying I've won a gift card? Um, and basically, we didn't want them to read the handbook. So we, we created, and this is a luxury again, I know, we created a Slack bot um, called Slash Security. And you just fill it out and, and it, you know, it'll create the right severity for you and ping the security response engineer on call if needed. Um, but yeah, I'll just skip this for time. Uh, but what it does do is because there's a place that anyone in our organization can go to when they are like, oh, security, what do I do? It's 24 seven as public. They can get it on their phone. They can get it on their non-work laptop. Um, they like, if they lose their laptop while they're traveling, they can go to a library and find like, what am I supposed to do again? Oh yeah. Email panic at gitlab.com. So 24 seven, wherever they are, it's fully public. Um, and yeah, they can have confidence and clarity that the process is right because it's been iterated on regularly. Um, we know that it's achieving our compliance objectives because we can see who's editing it. We can see that it's been edited at least once per annual or whatever. Um, and yeah, turning it into automation to make it more accessible or efficient. So we'll wrap up with some steps you can take. Basically, look at the stuff on the right and decide, are you ready for it? Some organizations I know uh, will have reason to segregate information, to separate information so that certain teams can't see how things work. I mean, this is true even at GitLab, but I don't have time to get into it, like our, our anti-abuse team. We don't really want to say publicly how that works because then people would abuse our platform. Um, anyway, uh, so some environments might require to not have a single source of truth. They might require multiple. Some places might require only certain people can work on documentation, um, or they might require a single person to approve it. So have a look at this, uh, the right-hand column and think, you know, is this possible within the organization? Um, maybe if it's not within the organization, think a bit you know, closer to home. Can you do it within your team? So maybe some first steps that you could take are to find and reuse, ideally if there's one already, a single source of truth that anyone can access. Uh, if you create another one, you're probably just adding like a fifth source of truth, <laughs> right? To, to a list of four already. So yeah, ideally find and reuse one if you can. Um, but as long as your team know, we're going to try and commit to the single source um, and then start with something your team does often. Don't do like black swan events, like ransomware or people losing their laptops or an insider threat. Like, yes, those are things to worry about, but hopefully they only happen like once, N not like once a week, right? So maybe things like, can I install this browser extension? How do I use a password manager? What even is a good password? What do I do if I get a phishing email? These are the kind of questions security teams get asked a lot and things that people will use a lot. Um, and so I'm more likely to keep up to date and keep it from going stale. 
um, yeah, start building that culture of small iterations. And then from that, show other teams, look, it's working for us and security is so cool now. Um, and maybe other teams will um, start adopting this single source of truth as well. Uh, yeah, and remember, so GitLab's uh, handbook is open. You can copy it as well, adapt it to your needs. I did this at my last job. I know of one speaker here who did it at their last job, and you know there may be others, so go for gold. Um, it's all there for you. Um, yeah, so that's that. If you're successful, you should hopefully take your documentation from shelfware to... Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>